about today is a class that is, um, it's one of my favorites. It's actually about benching, but it's connected to the three weeks and connected to the seven weeks of, of, of comfort. So it's really connected to this time of the year. Um, if you are a person like me, who during the week, I rarely wash my hands for bread. It basically never happens. Uh, but on Shabbos, I do it. And that's when I get a chance to bench. What my goal is, is that the next time that you bench is going to be a totally different experience because I'm going to share with you a message that is very, very powerful. But before I do that, let's go back to last Thursday when we were sitting on the floor and we were crying for the base of Migdash and we were reading Kinos. I don't know if you are old school like me, but I basically... I, I go through all the keynotes. That's what my father did. That's what his father did. I like to read the keynotes. I like to study the keynotes. And one of the keynotes basically tells us a story of what it was like to leave Egypt and what it was like to leave Yerushalayim. So it's basically what's called a contrast kina, which goes, but say, Mitzrayim, everything was good. But say, everything was terrible. And one of the things that we say is the following words. This is Kina Lamad Aleph. It says, Moshe Yirenu Ba'ari Nachnenu B'tseisi Mitzrayim. Moshe was our shepherd, and Aaron was our guide when we left Mitzrayim. Nebuchadnezzar, Ba'adrianus Kesa, B'tseisi Mitzrayim. Nebuchadnezzar and Hadrian, the Caesar, is when I left Yerushalayim. So when I saw that, it basically raised my eyebrow. And I said to myself, what is going on over here? Because everyone knows that the bad guys in the times of the Chorban of the second base of Mignash was not Hadrian, it was Vespasian. Vespasianus in Hebrew, uh, together with his famous henchman, Titus, Titus, Harasha. That was the person that destroyed the base of Mignash. Hadrian was a person that existed many, many years later. 70 years later, as we're going to see in a moment, and he did something else. Does anyone by chance know what was Hadrian for? If you're British, you'll say he built the wall that separates England from Scotland. But what did Hadrian do to the Jews that was bad? Anyone know? Anyone know? Hadrian? Aviva Lasky has just joined us. Woohoo, Aviva. What did Hadrian do when he came into the land of Israel? The answer is he destroyed the city of Beitar and he killed a man by the name of Bar Kokhba. And this, says the Rambam, was a chorban, a destruction that was very, very similar to the destruction of the base of Migdash, as we shall see in a moment, that the Rambam goes out of his way to tell us, do not think that the chorban of Beitar was less than the Chorban of the Beis HaMikdash, it was equal in size. And you are perfectly legit if you're thinking to yourself, Renesal, how can anything be as bad as the Chorban of the Beis HaMikdash? What is going on behind the scenes over here? What does this have to do with benching? And what does this have to do with my personal life and what I'm going through right now? And the answer is a lot. So um, expect uh, to, by the time that we're finished, that your eyes are going to be opened, you're going to understand benching on a whole new different level, a little bit of Jewish history, which is timely to this time of the year. So let us begin with the beginning and talk a little bit about a man called Hadrian. So just, you should know that Hadrian himself, when he became Caesar over the Roman Empire, for those of you that are history buffs, it was the year 117 of the Common Era, it was actually August the 9th. Where are we? This is August the 2nd. So August the 9th, 117 of the Common Era, 47 years after the Chorban, a man by the name of Hadrian takes over by a man called Trajan. Trajan was beforehand, in comes Hadrian, and he is a man with a vision. He wants to expand the Roman Empire to its fullest lim limits, and he wants to conquer all of civilization. So the two huge, big powers that were left, by far the biggest one were the Persians. The Persians and the Romans were always at war with each other. And uh, another nation was also in their way called Parthia. Parthia today 
is called Iraq. We call it Bavel, but during this period, it was called the Parthians. The bottom line is, is that Hadrian was preparing himself for this huge mega battle that would come against the, uh, the Parthians and then the Persians, and then he would basically have conquered the world. Now, if you are a person with that kind of a vision, so what matters to you is to make allies. And to make allies means that all the small little nations in your kingdom, you want to work with them. And he decided to be very, very friendly with the Jews, with the Yidden. And some of you may remember the following story. He met with a man called Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua, as you all know, was the teacher of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yeshua was one of the Gedoli Hadar, together with Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol. He went to Rome, and there was very, very famous, the Gemara brings down in Bechiris, a very, very famous dialogue between the Roman emperor and uh, Rabbi Yeshua. Eventually, Rabbi Yeshua was sent to Athens to debate the Athenians. And for those that you want, uh, there's, um, there's a, uh, well, I have a bunch of classes on that particular topic about the debates between the Greeks and between the Rabbi Yeshua. The bottom line is, is that he had a lot of respect for the Jews. He had a lot of respect for our culture and everything was good. And this lasted for seven years. For seven years, he basically was in, in love with the Yidden. And then round about the year 123, there was a man called Bar Kokhba who decided that he did not want to be run by the Romans, he was one going to run Eretz Yisrael. And he started a rebellion. And Hadrian had zero patience for a Jewish rebellion. And Hadrian came along and said, okay, you guys going to mess with me? That's it. Zero mercy. I'm going to turn from being a good guy, not just to be a bad guy. I'm going to do things that, as we're going to see in a moment, that even the Nazis, Yamach Shimon, did not dream of. He's going to come out with a ruthlessness and an evil and a viciousness and a sadism that was unheard of in the annals of history. We're going to see in a moment what he did. But the bottom line is, is that he took with him a huge army. And now I'm switching over to the words of the Rambam. Let me just read this to you. The Rambam brings down, this is in Hilchos Ta'anis, um, at the very end, Perakei, Allah Habes, Sarah Gadola, like I said, and he adds the following thing. Now, I just want to tell you, uh, the, the quote I have now is from a sefer called Seder Olam. Seder Olam was written by the, the, um, the, the, the same person as the Seder Hadaris brings him down, the Rav of Minsk. It's like a history book. And he says the following thing. He says that when the Jewish people were attacked by Hadrian, basically, and I quote, they came along and destroyed 1,000 Jewish settlements. I'm also mixing together uh, another quote, a fellow called Dio Cassius, who was a Roman that lived in what we call Israel today. He wrote a book called History of Rome. And he says, when they came in, they started a massacring festival and they killed, and I'm just quoting over here, half a million people. So. When you say half a million people, you're saying, well, 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 okay, but the Nazis killed kill six million people, right? So this was only half a million people. But wait and think for one moment. The whole Roman Empire in those days was 100 million people. In other words, today, when you have, an, a, a, let's say, a billion people, there's about there's five billion people. If you would kill um, the same equivalent, it's like literally you're killing 50 million people over here. The bottom line is, is that he came and he killed and he killed and he killed. And then the Gemara in Nizikin, Nun Zayin Amun Aleph brings down, he had 80,000 Karni Muhammad. Karni Muhammad means heads of battalions. And they came into Beitar and uh, they went on a killing fest. And by the time it was over, there was a river of blood that the Gemara brings down. It was two parts water, one part blood that went into the Mediterranean. Now, I just want to go uh, just on a little tangent over here. Uh, some of you have been to Beitar here in Israel. My, um, my, my, uh, my daughter lives in Beitar. Not just any old daughter. Some of you 
who are any Basi, you know who I'm talking about, and Aviva should know what I'm talking about. And I think Rachel, I don't know, whoever knows me knows I have a granddaughter called Princess Hani. Uh, she has a Blian Hara, she has special needs, she has Down syndrome. Uh, without quite, without, I don't, I'm not going to be, I'm not embarrassed to say that she's my favorite granddaughter, even though you're not supposed to say such a thing. But the bottom line is, Princess Khani is from Beitar. Beitar today cannot possibly be the same Beitar that was then, for a very simple reason, because there's no way you can have a river from where Beitar is today all the way into the Mediterranean. But the bottom line is, if I would stop the class now, you would say to me, okay, Rabbi Nissel, basically you're telling me that the reason why this was like the Chorban was because they killed a lot of people, but you're gonna see in a moment, that's not the point at all. The, the, the volume of murders is not the point. It's interesting. The Gemara actually says the following words. It says, for the next seven years, again, for the next seven years, the, the Romans used to cultivate their vineyards with that, with that blood of the Jews that was spilt in Beitar for seven years. Now, if you stop and think about what that means, it's really an incredible, incredible thing. Um, I have to share with you, by the way, this is not gonna be a morbid class except for the beginning. The morbid part is gonna be now, but by the time we end, it's gonna be a positive class. Some people are thinking now, I did not sign up to this incredible course, Sparks, of something, something, whatever this is called, just for Rabbi Nissel to tell me about terrible things that happened. But I, I want to share with you how awful Beitar was when it says that for seven years they tilled the soils of the Roman vineyards with Jewish blood. Um, about 20, 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, it's probably closer to 25 years ago now, I was one of the first people to go to Poland with a group, a seminary group. I don't want to show off, but you should just know that today seminaries go to Poland. And the way that Poland is done today, a lot of it came from what I and my colleagues back then, the way the vision of, of starting off in Warsaw and then going to Lublin and going to Krakow, which, which camps to visit. We worked on this very hard, but back then we went to a concentration camp called Sabibor. Uh, Sabibor, today is off the map, but you should know when we went there, in those days, the Poles did not know that you can make lots of money out of Jews. So we came to Sabibor and it was basically, literally a soccer field with little Polish kids, 10 year olds and 12 year olds playing soccer. A little sign that said, in this place over here, 600,000 peoples were murdered by the National Socialists during World War II. That's what it said, no mention of Jews. This is the way it was. Uh, 25 years ago when we went there for the first time. Um, the only visible sign that something bad had happened there was they kept up one watchtower. There was one watchtower over there. Besides that, there was this plaque and that was it. So we arrived there and, and literally we did not know what to do with ourselves. We felt kind of awkward. So what are we going to do now? Like, okay, I guess we'll say to Helen. And then this woman comes running towards us. I'll never forget her. She was like flapping her wings. She literally it was, she was like a cliche of what's called a Polish peasant woman. Um, she was a little older and she comes up and she's speaking rapidly in Polish and you could see like, you know, her, her peasant look on her face. It was just like, like she was really old school. And the, 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 um, our guide told us, she said, this woman, she wants to give us a tour of the place and tell us details of what happened here. And this was like strange. This woman, she turned out, she actually lived right there on two Sabibor station. That was her address. And her name was Yanina. And I said to her, Yanina, why on earth are you taking off an hour out of your time to give us a guided tour of Sabibor? You're not asking for money, why are you doing this? And she looked at me and she says to me, Rabbi, you should know that my father was murdered by the Nazis. And for me, this is the way I relive his memory. This, I do this in his honor. The bottom line is, is when her tour was over, I asked her the following question. I said, Yanina, you know that there are a lot of people today 
that deny the existence of the Holocaust. This was 25 years ago. Today, I would say that overwhelmingly the world believes one, one of two things. If you're a Muslim, you believe it didn't happen at all, but the rest of the world think that Jews have exaggerated grossly what happened. The bottom line is, we remain a nation on our own. Ish, hein am levadad yishkon. We're on our own, as always. I said to Yanina, tell me, are there people here in this area of Sabibol that believe that the massacres never happened? And you know what she said to me? She said to me, how crazy is this? She said to me, where you are now, within a 10 kilometer radius, they are still tilling the land with the ashes of Jews. You hear this? This was like 50 years later. It's like 50 years later, they were still tilling the soil, that cursed soil, that cur cursed Polish soil with the ashes of Jews. So a little bit you understand what Bar Kokhba was doing when he was doing all those murdering. And then afterwards they were tilling the soil with the blood of Jews. The bottom line is that was the physical massacre of human beings. But the Rambam comes along, excuse me, the Rambam comes along and he adds a new twist. And he says, now I'm gonna tell you the real reason why the Churban of Beitar was so bad. So today's class is not a Tisha B'Av class. If today was Tisha B'Av, I would talk about how the five things that happened on Tisha B'Av correspond to the five things that happened on Shiva Asa B'Tamuz. There's like, there's like five and five. The first five are the roots, the second five, are, so to speak, how they express themselves into the physical world. And I would show you how each one of the five is completely and totally different from the other. The Churban Beis HaMikdash was the destruction of the life force of Kla Yisrael. But the Churban of Beitar, says the Rambam, was the Churban of Malchus, the Churban of royalty, the Churban of the fact that the Jewish people once had a king. So you're thinking, so what was it like to have a king? Why is that such a big deal? And the answer is, the job of a king is not like, I don't know if you know I'm British, some of you don't know me, okay? So, you know, joy, good show, dare say what not, let's go see the queen. No, it's not just that the queen is pageantry and the queen has like this cool jewelry and a fancy throne and a fancy, a fancy a palace and, and lots of scandals with her grandchildren. That's not what we're talking about over here. We're talking about that once upon a time, the king basically was a microcosm of the country itself. And the king, he would bring out what was called the purpose of his realm into every single corner of his country. So if you are a Jewish king, your job is to bring out Hashem's will to the four corners of your realm and to make sure that Hashem's will is brought out to the whole nation. A nation without a king is a nation that has lost its purpose. It is floundering. It is not anchored. It has lost its roots in the soil of Eretz Yisrael without a melech. So who was Bar Kokhba? The original Bar Kokhba was a real king. What do you mean he was a real king? He was a person that came from David and Melech. He was a person that was a tzaddik, as we're going to see in a moment, that Rabbi Akiva himself, let me read you the words, why do you have to trust me? Uh, the, the Gemara brings down over here, not the Gemara, this is still the Rambam. The Rambam, in, um, and it's, it's almost identical words in the Yerushalmi in Tanis, Nilka de Er Gadola, a Beit Hashema, Vahaya Ba'alafim, the river vice Misrael, thousands and tens of thousands of Jews, Vahel Hemelach Gadol, Vidimu Kal Yisrael, a Gdele Chachamim, Shu Melech Hamashiach. You hear this? This is Rabbi Akiva. All the Gadolim said, This man is the Melech Hamashiach. The Nafal Biyada Raimim, and the, the Romans. Um, uh, uh, captured him, the Nergu, and, they, and he was killed, and everyone else was killed, and this was a tsara like the Churban Beis HaMegdash. The bottom line is, my Rebbe, Reb Moshe Shapiro, used to always say, people think that Bar Kokhba was a bad guy. Wrong, wrong, wrong. He was a bad guy at the end of his story, 
But when he started off, Rabbi Kiva looked at him and saw that he had the potential to be the Melech HaMashiach. He was, as we say, made out of the right stuff. He could have been the right person, and all the Gedolim knew it. As a matter of fact, I have over here um, other quotes. Um, um, he was a person that the Medrash brings down. He had an army of 450,000 soldiers. You know what he did? He said 250,000 of them have to sit and learn, and another 200,000 should go out and fight. Now, I want you to stop and listen to what I just said, because today, you know, people in the Israeli army today complain about Yeshiva Bachram, and they says there's too many Yeshiva students, and we say that Bar Kokhba was careful to make sure that at any given moment that the numbers were such that there would be more students studying Torah than actual fighters, because he knew that's how you win wars. Not only that, we have what's called today the Bar Kokhba Caves. You can go visit them if you go to the Yam HaMelech. You guys are stuck in America. But if you can bring, come down to Eretz Yisrael, um, you go down to the Yam HaMelech, you'll see the Bar Kokhba ca Caves. They found there letters of Bar Kokhba where he asks, my troops need, what do you think they need? Food, alcohol, music? No. They need Lulav and Esther because Sukkot is coming up. They found that in his letters. We well, also found where Bar Kokhba's, um, the place where, where, where where, where, where he, um, his encampment was, they found, there's a quote over here, and, uh, and they found a nine, a, a huge mound of tefillin, which is basically, it's just another saying that this guy really was, he started off as the right person. What went wrong? That's really not for today. Unfortunately, sometimes the biggest tzaddik can make mistakes. And he went on and he became a little bit too big for his own boots. He, he, he had a gaiva issue, and he felt that he could, he could do things on his own without siyata dishmaya. The bottom line is, the end of his story does not end well. And with that, Hadrian did this, this frenzy of murdering and massacring until literally he killed half a million Jews, and literally he created a river of blood. And now, at this point in the class, from now onwards, everything's gonna be positive. But I want to say to you the following thing. We're going to go back, and then we're going to go back in about 15 minutes. We're going back to the story of Bar Kokhba. But what I want you to remember for the, at the moment now is that all of I've done till now is only for one reason and one reason only. Because do you know that every single time you bench, you are talking about the story of Bar Kokhba? You are talking about what happened in Beitar. That, as we're going to see in a moment, is the fourth bracha in benching. But before I do that, let me just talk a little bit about benching. If you are a typical female, and I say typical female, I don't think men are any better. But if you're a typical female like my wife and my daughters, you suffer from a syndrome called benchophobia. Benchophobia means you're not going to wash even healthy bread like brown spelt bread. You're not going to wash, because if you wash, it means you're going to bench. My dear ladies, after this class, you're going to want to rush to the nearest piece of bread, because you're going to want to bench. Listen to this. The Medrash brings down, excuse me, this is not a Medrash. This is a Reb Chaim Vital quoting the Arizal. The Arizal, as you all know, is the father of what's called um, uh, modern-day Kabbalah. So his time was Reb Chaim Vital. The Arizal says, he says, if a person is careful with benching, that you should know that this is especially, excuse me, if a person is careful with brachos, but especially benching, because benching is Doraisa, is from the Torah, he says, you should know this is the easiest way to get Ruach HaKadosh, to get the Holy Spirit. This is what he writes over here. You want Ruach HaKadosh? This is the way to do it. So, so I have a quote over here from the Magad of Mezerich. He says, the Magad of Mezerich, as you know, was the greatest Talmud of the Baal Shem Tov. And he says the following words. He says, L'chavim the Birkas HaMazayin, Yaisem Etfilo. It's more important to have Kavana in benching 
then in your Shmona Esrei. He says, besides the fact that tefillin, tefillah is the Rabbanon, and benching is the Raisa, he says, every time you bench, Gairim Yichud Lamala, the Ava, the Achva, the Kola Alamais, or Merikin Shefa, or Bracha, La Oilema Tachtai. I'm going to translate, not that I know what I mean. Every time you bench, you unleash all this love and goodness and good vibes that come down into the lower world. The bottom line is, you want Ruach HaKedosh? If you want to unleash incredible goodness into the lower world, the way to do it is through benching. Now, just, you should know, uh, okay, I challenge you, which famous person in Chumash Bereshis needed Ruach HaKedosh to do something, so he had to eat first? Who wants, you can just, you can type the answer in the chat. Go for it, Basia. Basi. Um, was it Yaakov? No, but you're gay. No, but you're close. Which famous Chumash character in Sefer Bereshis? Yaakov was pretty close. But once I tell you the answer, you're all going to give me, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, I learned that in, in eighth grade. Um, is Daniela over there? Is that Daniela Engel? The great Dengel from... Yeah. From California. Okay, you should know this. The answer is Yitzhak Avinu. He wanted to give brachos to Aesop. And he told Aesop, go hunting for me. Yeah, Esther gives that. Oh, I knew that look. Okay, so the bottom line is, you all give me that I knew that look. Except for Yao. Ah, oh, there, Yao give me that I know that look. Okay, you all knew this. He needed to eat that, that venison because that would give him that like, ah, and then he could have Ruach HaKedosh. Now I want to ask you a question. And, 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 and it's such an, once you, you all know the answer, but once you, once you hear the answer, it's such a powerful statement. I'm saying to you something radical. I'm saying to you that benching is more powerful than a Shemona Esrei. And I spend my whole life teaching you how to dive on a Shemona Esrei, and I'm saying benching is even higher. Who here can give me an argument why benching should be greater than a Shemona Esrei? Shemona Esrei, literally, when you take your three steps, you're going into the Holy of Holies, the highest of highest. It's the greatest communion between man and God is the world of the Shemona Esrei. And yet, and yet, and yet, benching is higher. How could that be? Go for it, Esther. Um, I actually heard this part from Rabbi Shachter, who, who organized this. Um, That's cheating. I don't know if, it, if it's like a good, I don't know if it's answering your question. He said it's got to be good. Go for it. Share it with us. Okay, fine. <laughs> Um, he said that when we're in Shemona Esrei, it's quote unquote easy to concentrate when you're in Shemona Esrei, even though it's not, but it's easy to concentrate in Shemona Esrei when you need something. And most of Shemona Esrei is asking for things. And benching, we're talking to Hashem. Once we finish the entire meal, we're, we're full. We're, we're satisfied. We got what we needed. We don't need anything else from God. And yet Beautiful. we're speaking. Okay. Definitely, Esther, 10 points for Gryffindor. I'm proud of you. That was great. Now I'm going to say it better, okay? Put on your safety belts, because now I'm going to say it even better. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why does a person davenish when Esther? So as Esther correctly said, is that when a person is davenish when Esther, that's the moment when you recognize with clarity that you are not in control. God forbid a person has sickness, corona, chas v'shalom. God forbid a person has lost their job. God forbid a person needs a shidduch. You've been in dating for years and years. You can't find a shidduch. God forbid, God forbid you have a kid that's struggling, going off the derech. God forbid all the terrible things that happen in this world. So you take your three steps and you cry out, Hashem, I am not in control. You're in control. You're the one that can take care of me. So it's one thing to serve Hashem when you're at the bottom of the human, the human experience. You're at the bottom of the bottom. But what happens the opposite? What happens if you just came, you came. Basi's been trying now for a year to make it to the Nistles for a Shabbos meal. One day, Basi, you're going to make it. 
you come to the show to this. My wife is from Memphis, Tennessee. Boy, can she make food, okay? That's why you'll notice that the camera has to stop over here because below that is all good living, good living ladies. And the bottom line is, when you have a good Shabbos meal, and my wife makes Southern style, uh, whatever, schnitzel, whatever it is, and, and you gorge yourself, and, and life is so good, and you have dessert, and you have, everything is amazing, and then you turn to Hashem, and say, Baruch, I'm at the top of the world. Achalta v'savata. I've eaten, and I am satisfied, and I feel I am all-powerful especially if you harvested the food yourself, like the, the Talmud brings down, you feel infinitely powerful. And then you say, Hashem, everything I have is from you. So that is the highest of the highest form of connection. Once again, let me say this one, one more time. Tefillah, like you're at the bottom, and benching, you're at the top. When you're at the bottom and you turn to Hashem, so as Esther correctly said, there's a lot of clarity, okay? You know it's Hashem. But when you're at the top of the top and you just want to celebrate and drink another glass of wine and then have a chavrusa with your pillow, so at that moment then, you are at the top of the... If you still recognize that everything is from Hashem, so this unleashes all the goodness in this world. Now, with that thought in mind, I'm going to ask you, the next time you bench... I'm not allowing you to say the first words of benching before you put a smile on your face. I don't care if it's fake, okay? But my Rebbe, one of my Rebbe was called Rav Asher Zelig Rubenstein. And I, whenever I close my eyes and, and, and he's not alive anymore, I always picture him smiling while he benches. It was for him a celebration. That, and he was real, he wasn't faking at all. But if you, if you smile and you, think, you start a really expressing your appreciation. Now, Benching is made out of four brachos. One, two, three, and four. The first bracha is called Birkas Hazam. Birkas Hazam was written by who, ladies? Who wrote it? Moshe Rabbeinu. When did he write it? Just before he died. He knew that the mon was coming to a close. And he wanted Klaisel to remember that the same food that they're going to be making for themselves in Eretz Yisrael is exactly the same as the mom that came down from heaven in the base of Migdash. There's no difference, excuse me, in the Midbar. There's no difference between them. He wanted them to realize it's all from Hashem. Now I'm going to say to you that the first bracha in the Shemona Esra, if you want to summarize it in three words, B'chein, B'chesed, or B'rachamim. Remember those three words, Chain, Chesed, Rachamim. Chain means that uh, physically, it's gorgeous to look like. I, I, I forgot, I wanted to bring to my class right now, and I'm here in the back of the house in my little den over here. But in the kitchen, you see, you bring out fruits that are literally a pleasure to look like, to look at. I don't know why, but uh, we had on Shabbos a thing called cherries. Cherries is, is, is in, terms of, in terms of efficiency, it's a stupid fruit because it's tiny, it's got this huge pit in the middle that you go in, you wait till no one's looking and you say, you know what to do with a pit in your mouth, right? Especially if you're on a shidduch day, it's kind of awkward. But what do you do? You make your shechiano, it tastes incredible. And you think to yourself, next time I'm going to wait till I can have cherry ice cream or cherry soda or whatever it may be. But cherry is only chen. Chen means Hashem, it's physically beautiful to look at. Fruits are gorgeous. Um, Bechesed, what does Bechesed mean? Chesed means that that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that, um, that uh, what your taste is. So I happen to be British. My wife is from Memphis. Um, I have a daughter-in-law that uh, is a Sassoon. They come from, from India and before that from Iraq. Every single one of them has a different taste buds, different choices. And you know what? Hashem takes care of all of us, not just humans, even animals. B'chein, food is beautiful to look at. B'chesed, everyone gets based on what is their favorite food, or b'rachamim. Rachamim means it doesn't matter who you are. You could be the worst person in the world, and Akash Baruch Hu is still going to take care of you. Even the most evil person, even when, when Hadrian was destroying the Beitar, uh, Hashem was giving him delicious food to eat. 
the chesed of Arachmim. That is the first bracha of the Shemun Essay. What's the second bracha? No Delacha. Who wrote No Delacha? Yoshua. Okay, when did he write it? When it came into the land. Now, why do you need a second bracha? Because Yeshua wanted to teach us. It's not enough to eat food. Animals eat food. Lahavdil, an atheist, can eat food. Food just keeps you alive. But it's not enough to eat food. You have to do something with your life. When you say what is called to express your life in a healthy way, what's called to allow yourself to flourish, if you want to achieve something, so that's the second bracha. We thank you, Hashem. And there, you'll notice that the word al appears seven times. You have the word al ha'aretz, kimitzrayim, brismila, teira, chukim, and then achilas mazon. Seven times we say, thank you for this and for that, for teira and for the brismila and for Eretz Yisrael. These are all the things that allow us to express ourselves so that we can do things with our lives. Um, for those of you that know me, which is a whole bunch of you, so you'll know that I always, always say to you, I don't care at all how busy you are with your life. Always make sure that you feel that you're doing something productive because that's the first step to feeling bad about yourself. So Eretz Yisrael is the natural place where a Jew can feel productive, where you can feel that they're doing something with their lives. So that is seven owls. By the way, there's an eighth owl. The eighth owl is Al Hanisim. How cool is that? Get it? The number eight? Remember that when it comes to Hanukkah. The eighth letter Al, time the word Al appears, is Al Hanisim. Anyhow, let's get back to the third bracha. What's the third bracha? Is, is Hatayv, excuse me, is Birkas Yerushalayim, Bainay Yerushalayim. Who wrote that? David Melach for Yerushalayim. Shlomo Melach added the base of Migdash. The third bracha is not that we have to flourish and succeed. The third bracha is that we have to achieve shlemus. Shlemus is the base of Migdash. Shlemus is when you build the base of Migdash in your Shlaim or Akedash. So let me summarize. Bracha one, bracha two, and bracha three. One is the food to, to keep us alive. Number two is the journey to shlemus, And number three is the shlemus itself. Those are the first three brachas of benching. And now let's talk about the fourth bracha. The bracha teva hametiv. The bracha teva who was added by who? In Yavne. When did they do that? After the massacre in Beitar. What's this got to do with anything? Why am I saying this in benching? Why is the massacre in Beitar different? That it is so special that it gets its own bracha. Why is the massacre in Beitar something that is, that is worse and, and, not, and, and, and we're going to see in a moment more inspiring than anything else that the rabbis felt here we have to add a bracha into the benching. Now listen to this because what I'm about to tell you now is something incredible. The Gemara brings down, and you've all heard this, but let's go over this one more time. After Hadrian, had destroyed Beitar. He wanted to make sure that no Jew would ever, ever think about touching the Roman Empire. He wanted the Jews to give up hope. He wanted what we call in Hebrew, Yeush. We will never, ever succeed. Do you know what he did? He told the Roman troops to gather up all the dead bodies. Don't bury them. Stack them up vertically, okay, like this one next to each other, and he created a wall that went round the vineyards that he owned, 18 by 18 mil. A mil is approximately a kilometer. It was like the distance, the Gemara says, from Tiberias to what we call Tzva. Thousands and thousands of dead bodies were stacked up and turned into human dead fences. The reason why he did this was something that the Nazis would have been proud of. He wanted to terrorize the Jewish people. That we should always be afraid of the Romans. We should have that visual of seeing your own you know, loved ones, not being allowed to be buried, turned into basically wall material 
for the purpose for the Romans to be able to intimidate and terrorize the Jews. But do you know what happened? The Gemara brings down two miracles happened. Miracle number one, the bodies did not decay. Not only did they not decay, that when the moment that the person was killed, their faces were shining, and you could see that that person was still like, you know, if it was somebody you loved, you felt like that they were came out alive, even though they were dead. So they and you know. I, it's, it's boiling hot out here in Yerushalayim. The sun should turn a dead body and it should disintegrate. That's not what happened. The body stayed, the woman, it was just fresh, he murdered that moment. And then eventually, Hadrian realized that his whole plan had backfired because instead of intimidating the Jews, the Jews were all coming to see what was going on and saying, Hashem has not abandoned us. You think that this terrible massacre is the worst thing? No. Hashem is so close. Hashem loves you so much. Hashem is so, so close. We just can't see him. But that was the way Hashem was communicating to his people. That everything you see is just a, an illusion. I'm actually very close. And anyone that knows anything that's happening in Corona is that anyone who thinks that they know what's going on, the only thing that we will say to them again and again and again is you don't know what Hashem is doing. Don't even try and figure out. Don't be one of these smart rabbis that say, oh, Hashem is this, Hashem. No. The only thing we know for sure is that Hashem is close. Hashem is close. Just like when Titus went into the Holy of Holies, that no one's allowed to go in there except for the Kohen Gadol. On the holiest day, he saw the two Kruvim one crew is Hashem, the other crew is Kla Yisrael, and they are together hugging like husband and wife. In the Holy of Holies, at the worst moment in history, Hashem is saying, look how much I love you. Look how close I really am. I just can't show you. I can't show you. So Hashem's love for us is so close. So that is what Hashem was showing us when we say, Hatoiv, Hashem is good. He's really close. He doesn't abandon us. And then Hadrian says, okay, so bury them. So that's called Hamativ. Toiv is that they didn't decay. Mativ that they were allowed to be buried. What's the big deal about burying someone? Why do we bury a loved one? The answer is because Jews do not believe in death. Jews do not believe in death. Death is an illusion. When a person dies, you put them in the ground, you're planting them like seeds. Because Jews believe in Tchias HaMesim. Jews believe that we are going to be there forever and ever and ever and ever with Hashem. So this fourth bracha, belief that Hashem is close when you can't see Him, and belief that death is an illusion and that a Jew is eternal and will live forever, that is the fourth bracha, and that is the bracha of Golos. When a person has a meal, every single time you bench, you remind yourself of these two things, no matter how hard your life is. And I know that every single one of you, I hope that you yourselves are not, every single one of you can immediately tell me five names of people that you love, that are suffering. Each one of you, in a flash, five names of people that are turned to God and say, God, what are you up to? But if they could see just a teeny weeny bit of what Hashem is doing, how close he is, how much he loves them, how much he cares about them, and that belief that everything that is happening, this whole thing called death, is nothing more than illusion, would realize just how close and how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us. And this is the great secret of benching. And benching, let's go over the four things one more time. First bracha, Hashem gives us food. Bechein, bechesed, barachmin. Number two, He allows us to flourish and to find meaning in our lives. That's nod lacha. The third is the destiny of the Jewish people, Yerushalayim in the base of Migdash. And the fourth one, the fourth bracha, that when things are hard and Hashem is hidden, and there's chorban, and there's sadness, and there's frustration. So you should know that Hashem is so close. Hashem loves us so much. If only we could just open our eyes, we would lose our free choice. 
<coughs> to see the extreme love and the extreme care that Akash Baruch has for her. That is the fourth bracha of the Shemona Esrei. So let me summarize what I came to say to every single one of you. Number one, a practical message. I want you, next time you bench, to look at those first, those four brachos, Avram's, excuse me, Moshe's bracha, Yeshua's bracha, David and Shlomo's bracha, and then the bracha for Golos, that Hashem is hidden, but he's so close. And the Akash Baruch Hu says, all the sadness and all the tears, those are tears that you're planting in the ground, infinity, that you're going to live forever and ever with me after Tchiyas HaMesim. Now, all these things are happening in front of our own eyes. Now look at the words of that fourth bracha, and look how they end. What are the last words? Hashem's goodness is always, even at the worst moment that you think is the worst moment. Hashem's goodness is, is infinite and in everything that you really, really need in life. HaKadosh Baruch is giving you 1,000%. Those are how we end that fourth bracha. So I want to give you all, um, I don't know where you guys are. I just wanted to say what an honor it is to teach you guys seven more classes together. Uh, I just say that uh, 